I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I got to do is breathe underwater. In a lab somewhere, two scientists are about to make a major discovery. They've created the world's first laser-guided fish eggs. We're almost there. Elements becoming unstable. It's been unstable before? Yes, but did it start beeping faster and faster before? Never like this. I think I saw the Swedish chef make that same dish once. The major discovery I mentioned? When things go kaboom too close to a scientist, the kaboom wins. Very interesting, Doctor. I know it must seem like just a simple one-celled protozoa, but it did take nature two billion years to evolve it. This is really hard to follow. I'm reasonably sure he's claiming that he and the other scientists created these things. Essentially, he's saying they created life. Unfortunately, kept alive only for moments. Ah, it's amazing. I'm surprised they lived at all. Oh, we can do much more. It's too much human misery. No reason today for allowing human beings to be born deformed. Prepare to be as confused as I am because you'll never quite get around to explaining why growing one-celled organisms in a test tube has anything to do with human birth defects. That's why this voyage is important. Why it must be successful. You see, most of our work to date has been confined to the laboratory. We're going to learn so much more now going to the very cradle of existence. Even after watching the episode multiple times, I still can't make sense of his project. Somehow, he and his late colleague tracked down the specific spot in the ocean where life ostensibly began. His goal is to collect the specific elements that made it happen and recreate the event with his lab equipment. Once again, what this has to do with birth defects will never be explained. He pulled that statement out of the air and it won't come up again. The last time we saw John Anderson, he was Abraham Lincoln in Voyagers. It was one of three times he played the iconic president. He also played Andrew Jackson twice and Teddy Roosevelt once. He seems to have looked like a lot of presidents, or else historically the leaders of this country all look alike. This stuff is all over Captain Crane's head. The main thing he needs to know is, where do I take us? Well, this sets us right between uh, Malvis Ridge The Vima Seamount. I uh, know, it's a pretty rough stretch of ocean bottom. Rough? It's the most treacherous piece of ocean in the charts. There must be some other place you can pick up these elements. Many submarines have gone into that area. Many didn't return. But Dr. Janus is adamant this is the only place where this combination of elements occurs in the entire ocean. It's where evolution began. It's the place we must go if we're... Uh to recreate life exactly as it was four billion years ago. Where Crane's number one concern is the safety of the boat and crew, Admiral Nelson's science senses tingling and it's overriding everything else. Creating life was a huge goal in the 50s and especially in the 60s. The discovery of DNA made a lot of scientists think that, now that we had the building blocks of life, we didn't need anything else and could study, explain, and even guide evolution ourselves. Few of them came out and said it, but the goal was to eliminate the need for God, a creator. 
If we could create new DNA, essentially assemble the building blocks of life into something genuinely alive, that would prove that life, the universe, and everything could have just happened without the need for any guiding hand or ultimate causality. But these efforts fail to ask the fundamental question, what is life? What defines something as alive? I remember as a kid seeing a story about some lab that claimed they had created DNA out of whole cloth, and they said they had created life. To this day, I've never heard another word about it. DNA isn't life. It's a chemical that affects living things, but on its own, it is not alive. We can't define that word in a scientific sense because there are factors unique to living organisms that we frankly can't explain. These factors are so nebulous, there's no way to measure them or even observe them. So all these efforts were doomed to failure, but this was also the era of existentialism, the God is dead movement, and all the rest. Existentialism failed to provide satisfying answers to life, and God gave an interview on 60 Minutes to prove that he was still alive, so there went that idea. Right now, though, we're right in the big, fat middle of that whole movement to create life, and Captain Crane doesn't have a choice. He'll take our man to the spot. But if this gets them all killed, he's putting the Admiral on report. How does it look? Rocky. Radar shows surface turbulence all along our course, and sonar shows the same thing under sea. Take your choice. Well, it's your department, Lee. You do whatever you think best. Crane thinks it's best to forget this whole thing and go home, and honestly, if it was me, that's what I would do, and I'd throw the Admiral's words back at him when he questioned me. Crane is a better officer than I am. Speaking of officers, somebody just got a promotion. Hi. Is it time for your watch already? Yeah, those four hours off go by pretty fast. Mm, they sure do. Well, we're on course now, so keep it steady as you go. Now, here's our destination right here. That's right near the Vima Seamount. Mm-hmm. Let me know as soon as we're ready to set down. Captain, that area is unsafe. Safe or not, that's where we touch down. Clark keeps arguing. He says it's suicide to go in there. The area is known as the submarine graveyard. Crane is trying to assure him that they've assessed the risks and are prepared to handle them. Clark isn't buying it. It's our business to take risks, but we don't take them blindly. The Admiral's in charge of scientific projects. Believe me, he doesn't want to lose this ship any more than we do. Well, that all sounds fine, Captain. But I had an older brother. He was the exec on the sea lion. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Uh, they were the last submarine to cruise near the Vima Seamount. He says if we get any closer, we'll be able to see their wreckage. It's still there, and Clark isn't interested in joining his brother. Captain Crane won't budge, so he'll try something else. Admiral? You're the only one who can abort this mission. You've got to. We can't go in there. You get back to your post. Immediately. You don't know the Vima Seamount. I do. My brother knows it even better. He and 120 men of the Sea Lion are still there. Arguing with a direct order from an admiral is not an advisable thing to do, and raising your voice to him is even less advisable, but Clark is close to losing it. Nelson says, there's a proper way to do this. Go back to your post, and I'll hear you out when you follow proper procedure. By that time, you'll have killed us all. Mr. Clark, you are relieved of all duties. You confine yourself to quarters for the remainder of this voyage. You won't kill us. I won't let you. I've already changed the course. We're going to bypass the Seamount area. What? Oh, man, you do not do that. He just bought himself a trip to the brig. Here we are. X marks the spot. All right, Chip, sit it down. On what? That passing tree stump? Lee, we're just asking for trouble. Asking for it? We're begging for it. I have a feeling trouble won't disappoint them. Let's get Dr. Janus out there to collect his elements so we can get out of here. In fact, Captain Crane would just as soon skip that first part. 
The seismograph's still coming up with bad news. To make matters worse, a pressure area is building up. This trench can cave in on us at any time. Uh, it is beginning to look bad. All right, then let's get out of here. I said bad, not hopeless. We have to stay. Just beyond that window. The beginning. So quit talking, get your bony butt out there, get what you need, and let's go. The underwater sequence is nothing special. My only question about it is, if they went out in current that strong, why weren't they wearing tethers? I've known someone who was diving, got hit by a massive burst of current and swept away and was never found. It's nothing to mess with. There's a place not far from here that has some of the best diving in all of Puget Sound. It's diveable maybe five days a year because it's an underwater funnel. As the tide rises and falls, current goes shooting through that funnel at speeds that could make it hard for a full-size ship to fight against, never mind a scuba diver. I've been diving Puget Sound for over 10 years and I've been to that place twice. To put it bluntly, current scares me. I'm with Mr. Clark and Captain Crane. Screw the experiment. Let's get out of here. It's a sawfish. They're enormous and harmless. Their favorite thing to do with humans is ignore us. And besides, there's no need to panic. You're only six inches from the surface anyway. I thought the conventional wisdom said life started down on the actual bottom in their primordial ooze. What does he expect to find in those rocks? Careful, careful now, careful. These elements have been wrestling for billions of years. We don't want to disturb them now. I guess it's a good thing beating them with a hammer didn't disturb them. In the lab, he's put the elements together and hit them with his machine, which he calls an energizer. No. Nothing outlasts the energizer. No. Somehow this thing stimulates growth and evolutionary development. A peek in the microscope reveals that he's grown more fish eggs. Lee, take a look at this. Absolutely incredible. This is worth a look, too. Yes. Doctor, how long is the gestation period? 24 hours. Sea view must remain as steady as possible for that period. And how are we going to do that with the ocean bottom kicking up all around us? Like that. I'm not sure Dr. Janice grasps just how much peril they're in sitting here like this. Everything seems to be all right. It may be all right in that test tube, but it's not all right out there. These reports say sea quake. Bad enough to cause an avalanche that could bury all of us. Well, the specimen does look exactly as it was before. Then let me get this ship out of danger. Is that specimen worth 125 lives, Admiral? They seem to forget that even supposing this experiment is a raving success, if it's buried under tons of rock at the bottom of the ocean, nobody will ever know it. Well, if we could be sure that the vibration wouldn't trigger a reaction, you can't ever be sure of an experiment like this. Then forget the experiment. It's impossible. Hardly. Pack up your fish eggs, put them in the airlock, and release them to the ocean. Experiment aborted. Another few hours. In another few hours, we'll be dead. Let's dump this specimen and get out of here. There's a whole undersea mountain ready to fall on top of us. Now, that's enough trouble to handle at one time without Dr. Janus getting in over his head with an unstable element. Captain, I told you the specimen seems... is as stable as it was before. A little slip of the tongue there, Professor. An accidental admission that you're not as sure of this whole mess as you let on. He already has the specimen in a special cradle, sort of a gimbal setup that absorbs the shocks of normal subactivity. Admiral Nelson says then it can absorb the motion of the sub if we take things slow and easy. Lee, get us out of here. He convinces Janus to knock off for the night. They can't do anything with the specimen but hurry up and wait anyway.
So that's where bouncy balls come from. Except in 1967, it wasn't a bouncy ball, it was a Super Bowl. And where bouncy balls today are about this big, the Super Bowl was almost as big as a baseball. I had a few, and they were more fun than you could imagine. If you threw it against a wall hard enough, you'd swear it was made of flubber. But this ball is different from the Super Bowl made by Whammo. This one grows. Set a course for home, Chip. Consider it set. And try not to bump into anything on the way, okay? Oh, the quake is starting. Sorry, Chip. Pull ahead one third. One third? One third, Chip. Pull ahead one third. Mr. Morton doesn't know about the slow and steady plan. He's just following orders. Except that order. I told him not to bump into anything. There's a breach in the hull. Curly, Kowalski, and a couple of others are putting some steel plates in place to plug the leak. They have to head for yet another small plateau and set down to make repairs. I really hope this experiment is worth the wear and tear on the boat. And the men. If nobody else is going to say it, I will. Congratulations, Doctor, you have a bouncing baby slug. I don't understand it, but it's wonderful. It's turned completely into matter overnight. You mean this grew in just those few hours? Fantastic scientific achievement. How big is it going to get before it stops growing? That's an interesting question, Doctor. He didn't even know it was going to do this. You expect him to know the answer? Nelson says we'll study everything we can about it, plug the data into the computer, and try to find out. Janice keeps saying it's pure matter. That makes me wonder what else he expects it to be made of. It's doubling in size every three hours. And its weight that's more important and more dangerous. Its weight's multiplying dozens of times faster than its bulk. I can't pretend these figures aren't alarming. Well, there's only one thing to do. Destroy that thing before it's too late. No. no. Admiral, listen to me. We've had this fantastic stroke of luck. And you're determined to leave it on the ocean floor along with your carcass. You have your data. You have your notes and all the rest. So dump that thing and be satisfied with what you got. We're on the threshold of success. You're a scientist. You know what this discovery could mean. We must get the specimen safely back to the Foundation Laboratories. And that's fine, except he won't let them make any kind of speed to do so. He's putting the Sea View and everyone on it in an impossible position. I have a feeling we all should have listened to Clark. He's losing his marbles down in the brig, and he may be the only rational one here. Crane has to talk some sense into the Admiral. He explains just how precarious their situation is, and the Admiral is weakening. All those scientific visions of tomorrow running around in your head. Your desire to see this experiment come off. Well, just make sure of one thing. You don't minimize the danger. There it is. That's the statement that broke through. Admiral Nelson designed and built this sub, and he knows her limitations. It's about time he started paying attention to them. Sure. If we decided to make a run for home, what kind of time could we make? Mm. 40, 41 hours. Mm -mm. Remember when that spittin' Polish admiral got after Crane for calling Chip Chip? The captain told him in front of the man he calls him Mr. Morton, and ever since he said that, I don't think he's actually done it once. And now we see why Nelson is setting the example. 
In any case, they figure if they run the reactors wide open and pump it all into the engines, they can make it in 24 hours. That means it will have doubled in size eight times by the time they arrive. That makes me wonder how many bulkheads they'll have to remove to get that thing out of there. Because I have a feeling it doesn't squish very well. Everything all right? We're still on course and we're still going at top speed. You know, the Admiral might be right. We might make it a home plate at that. We've still got ten hours to go. I've got ten hours left to go. You go get some sleep. I think I'll stick around here for a while. Not on my watch, you won't. I'm the watch officer. You go get some sleep. Not many people can give Captain Crane an order, but Chip Morton is one of them. As we watch him develop and understand more about his relationship with Captain Crane, I like him more and more. He'll be with us for the entire run of the show. Irwin knew a good thing when he saw it. Good morning, Chip. Good morning there, Skipper, old buddy. The men are all acting drunk, but that seems to be escaping the captain. We're in practically the same spot we were in last night. You've been taking us around in circles. We'll never make it back to port in time now. He still doesn't get it. He thinks they're all doing this on purpose. Somebody grab a clipboard because he needs a good bop on the head. Thankfully, Nelson comes in and takes charge. He calls for the doctor and a replacement crew because at least he can see that there's something seriously wrong with these men. Doesn't look like any blood sample I've ever seen before. It's blood all right. As a matter of fact, it's a sampling of Chip Morton's blood. The reason it looks so strange, it has an abnormally high nitrogen content. Nitrogen? Where could that have come from? That's not the question. The question is, where did all the oxygen go? They'll reason that the men were feeling what used to be called rapture of the deep. Today, we call it nitrogen narcosis. According to Nelson and Janus, it happens when there's too much nitrogen and not enough oxygen. The truth is, we have no idea why it happens. It has something to do with dissolved nitrogen in the bloodstream, but why it affects people's brains the way it does is still a mystery. Most divers compare it to being tipsy. I've experienced it twice and don't care to experience it again. I didn't feel drunk or lightheaded. I freaked out. I had such a case of paranoia, I got the closest I've ever come to panicking underwater. The good news about nitrogen narcosis is, all you have to do is go up a few feet and it goes away. Our men are trapped inside a tin can, so they can't do that. The big question is, what caused it? Where did all the oxygen go? So that's it. Your specimen is feeding on pure oxygen, leaving us to breathe a nitrogen-heavy mixture. They can adjust the scrubbers in the air recycler to compensate, but that's a temporary fix. As that thing grows bigger and bigger, it eats more and more oxygen. Eventually, there won't be any more. And then there's the matter of its insane weight. O'Brien, what's going on up there? I don't know, Captain. We're losing trip. I've tried to compensate with extra power, but the reactor is giving out. Its weight is throwing the sub's trim off and forcing them to the bottom again. But if it keeps growing, they may never get off the bottom again. The reactors are strained to the utmost, but it's just too heavy, and the buoyancy of the ballast tanks isn't enough to compensate for it. Dr. Janus. Safety of the sea view and everyone aboard. That specimen must be destroyed. No, I. Uh, I can't let you do that. Somebody explained to him that it's not his decision. When it comes to the safety of the sub, he has no authority. He's a ride along. But he's so far up his own test tube, he doesn't grasp that. Hasn't it done enough damage? One of my officers has been driven to the edge of insanity. I don't know who's going to crack next. And we're lying helpless on the bottom. Its weight is keeping us down, and it's growing so fast, it'll soon be bursting through the bulkheads. Growing, that's, uh, that's it. I'll, I'll stop its growth, uh, 
I've learned enough about its chemical makeup. Now I'll uh, add another element to uh, neutralize it. We'll keep it alive just as it is. That won't help. He just told you its current weight is keeping the sub on the bottom. He is not listening, but something he said got their attention. If he knows how to stop its growth, he must also know how to kill it. I won't. I won't kill it. Don't you see? I can't. It's almost as if... Go on, doctor, say it. It's almost as if it's your child. Or beyond that, it's almost as if he's gotten a taste of playing God. No. No, it's not almost as if you created it. Man, man does not create life. Um, it was a fine experiment, but somehow it turned out to be a, a horrible accident. And... I think it was a mistake from the very beginning, but that, that doesn't matter now. What we have to do now is to destroy it. To destroy it immediately. It would seem the doctor has suddenly seen the light. I did what I started out to do. Accelerated evolution beyond all possible imagining. All that searching to find the reason why it took nature four billion years to evolve from protozoa to man. No the reason now. Fine. You learned what you wanted to know, so can we get rid of that thing and go home? Evolution is such a gradual, seemingly endless process. Its secret is its success. Adaptability. See, I created matter without giving it time to evolve. That uh, specimen in the laboratory is a living, growing thing with no adaptability. All it knows is eat grow and eat some more until it destroys itself and the sea view. Through a convoluted conversation that I managed to follow so you don't have to, he concludes that carbon is going to be its poison, specifically carbon dioxide from a whole passel of fire extinguishers. It's working. The creature is absorbing the carbon along with the oxygen, and it's starting to feel it. I'll move around to the other side, force-feed it from both directions at once. If you have a feeling that squeezing past it into that tiny space is a bad idea... You're right. It may not have a brain, but it does have a sense of self-preservation. A much stronger one than Dr. Janus has, apparently. Here's a question to ponder. Every time one of these shows does a Frankenstein story, should Mary Shelley's estate get a royalty? First Dr. Benton, then Dr. Janice. I keep wondering why. But then there are so many things there are no answers for. Maybe it's better that way. Better for who? It wasn't better for either of those guys. But the quiet implication is there are things we aren't meant to understand and we would do well to keep our noses out of them. Well, perhaps all the answers are right here. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. I know if some shows quoted the Bible like that today, Twitter would have a meltdown and people would be screaming boycott. But nobody's pushing any religion or anything like that. We're using a common quotation that just about everybody at the time was familiar with to convey the message, some things are beyond our capability. Creation of life is one of those things. Study it, examine it, analyze it, sort out how long it took, see how it evolved. But don't try to do it. That's way above our pay grade. I'm breathing underwater. I'm weightless through space. 
I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I got to do is breathe underwater. That was terrible. Okay. He just bought a trip. If they, uh, if then, yeah. and the special, yeah, slow down. Going orders. Merle is weaking. 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 I love you, good girl. You're my good baby, aren't you? <laughs>